How do you kill a god? Well, you become one. And that, that's the tale of one of the greatest RPG worlds of all time that almost no one knows about. So today, let's dive into the themes, society, and narrative of this forgotten gem from a legendary studio. The armies of Kairos the Overlord have swept across the known world. All who stood against them fell before their might. You were among the youngest of the court of Fatebinders when Kairos' armies came to our lands. How could we have known that the fate of thousands would rest in your hands? 2016 was a really good year for video games. Overwatch, Titanfall 2, Dishonored 2, Doom, and many more. But not every great game gets its time in the spotlight. And for Obsidian Entertainment, one of the biggest names in modern RPGs, the release of Tyranny in 2016 marked a tumultuous period. Coming just off the backs of one of the most successful crowdfunding campaigns of all time with Pillars of Eternity, Obsidian wanted to make something a little different before committing to a sequel. And lo and behold, that something a little different turned out to be Tyranny, another CRPG using many of the systems from the Pillars franchise, but this time from the perspective of a character who was working for the bad guys. It was an idea they had at the studio going on over a decade, when originally in 2006 they pitched a game called Fury, based on a massive and cataclysmic magical apocalypse, and later in 2009 created design docs for a never-before-seen product called Defiance, which took place in a world already overrun with evil, both ideas that eventually made it into tyranny after the company escaped financial ruin with the Pillars of Eternity Kickstarter. Sadly though, this underrated gem never got the recognition it deserved, and instead, now is a game most people don't even know Obsidian worked on, a forgotten relic that lies in the shadows of juggernauts like PoE, Outer Worlds, and soon Avowed. It's sad too, because while Tyranny falters on so many levels, all of which we'll get into deep discussions about in this video, the core of this game and its message is so powerful and thought-provoking, and it's why I think even if you don't play it, you need to know about it. Tyranny starts off with you creating your character. It's a very bare-bones system that has a minor selection of options for hair and body type. But luckily, it doesn't matter all that much since the game is played from a top-down perspective, with no cutscenes, and personally, I never usually care all that much about how my character looks in-game anyways. But it's here we get to choose our history, attributes, and skills, all of which will play a critical role in how we build and play our character throughout the game. Things like athletics dictate if we can climb and push things around in game to find secret passageways, subterfuge determines our ability to sneak, pickpocket, and lockpick, and lore is by far the most important skill in game, which allows us to not only have a better understanding of the world with more dialogue options, but also is the main stat used to not only make spells, but also make them more powerful something we'll dive into more here shortly. And after making your character, before starting the game, first you must go through a system called Conquest, which allows you to choose the decisions your character made before the start of the game. In the story, the great and powerful leader known as Kairos has conquered almost all of the known continent Teratus, looking to impose strict rule and order. The last remaining bastion of hope and freedom lies in a small section of Teratus's western coast called the Tears, which Kairos has ordered to be taken over, instructing the leaders of her two great armies to invade and overthrow. In conquest mode, you decide the fate of what happened in this original invasion, where the armies of the Disfavor led by Graven Ash and the chaotic barbarian legions of the Scarlet Chorus, led by the voices of Narat, both under the rule of Kairos, fight the rebellious factions of the Tears. You are a Fatebinder, someone who has been chosen as a judge and executioner of Kairos' laws, who acts under the rule of the Archon of Justice, known as Tunon the Adjudicator, who is one of the many Archons that Kairos has appointed as leaders of smaller sections of Teratus. So in Conquest, you decide which armies you helped, whether that be the Scarlet Chorus or Disfavored, and whether or not you spared innocent civilians or butchered them like cattle. After all, don't forget, you start this game as the bad guy. And on top of all of this, you get to decide the fate of entire regions of the map before you even get to play on it. Right from the start, your decisions have drastic consequences. And that's one of the things that makes Tyranny so great. You see, lots of games nowadays focus on making deep or long campaigns and experiences, where your choices and actions affect the world but in middling ways, always coming back to the same stories and adventures in the end. But Tyranny takes a different approach. 
it's what can be thought of as more of a wide game instead of deep. Where many games in this same genre can span well over 100 hours of playtime, my first playthrough of Tyranny only took me about 20. The genius though is that those 20 hours only showed me a fraction of what this world had to offer, and it's only on future playthroughs making completely different decisions and game that allow you to not only experience new aspects of the story and its characters, but also unlock entire parts of the map that you might not have known even existed on previous playthroughs. For example, there's a location in-game called the Burning Library that has some of the best art design and lore in the entire game, and I wasn't even able to go there on my first playthrough because of decisions I had made right at the start of the game in Conquest Mode. It's this type of game design I wish more developers would actually take the risk on, because it's so rewarding having decisions you make in-game have such drastic consequences, and it makes the story become very replayable since how it happens can dramatically shift based on your playthrough. Don't get me wrong though, because I do get it. Putting all that effort into content that the large majority of the player base won't even see must be heartbreaking, but it really does give the game a sense of staying power, I think at least. Regardless though, this is only the start of the interesting choices you will make in Tyranny, because it's after character creation and the decisions you make in Conquest Mode that the real game begins. Thrust into the heat of battle, the game starts with you being instructed to bring the news of a new edict from Kairos to the two main generals on the front lines of the war. And it's also here we get to see our first real challenges in combat. In Tyranny, combat is real time, meaning you control yourself and a full party of up to three other NPCs that all have their own special abilities and builds that must be managed on the fly. To counteract the complexity of the system, you can pause the game at any time and pick what you want your team to do next, whether it be attacking, healing, or casting a spell. And this means at higher difficulties, the game becomes very strategic, but also very overwhelming. The issue though isn't that the combat is difficult to manage, it's just that it isn't very good. Having to wait upwards of 5 seconds each time my character swings their sword or casts a spell in combat makes it feel very slow and awkward, and speeding it up only causes further issues due to the amount of things you have to keep track of between your party and enemy, meaning you are constantly pausing and restarting encounters, especially if you're a new CRPG player like myself, and even more so in the first act, which on higher levels of difficulty is grueling to say the least. Honestly though, over time the combat does start to get better as you get more spells spells and more skills which allow you to cast things like massive fireballs and ice waves that will obliterate entire legions of enemies at once. But for the first opening hours of the game, options like this are very limited, and it means many of the combat encounters become long, drawn out, and boring challenging your patience more than your wits. Luckily though, the story itself makes up for the pitfalls of the initial gameplay. After fighting your way through a small drove of enemies, you start to make your way across the map to where the generals of the Disfavored and Scarlet Chorus are currently speaking. In Tyranny, to travel around the map, you must choose where to go and spend real in-game time traveling there, always with the potential to find random encounters and engagements. It's a great system that takes the tedium out of travel while still making the world feel alive and lived in oftentimes with random encounters offering extensive insights into the lore. Nonetheless, after first using the map and traveling to the general's camp, you meet with both of them to inform them that Kairos has declared a new edict, of which you must read aloud to both of them. It's made clear that within seven days, the Ascension Hall, a massive throne room in the heart of the Tears, must be captured in the name of Kairos, or all in the valley will be killed in an instant. You see, these edicts that Kairos casts are the reason he or she has been able to take over the entire continent of Teratis, with each edict being a set of demands and rules that must be met, and if they are not, massive cataclysms and death will fill the lands, including many zones we will travel to in-game that are already wrought with world-altering edicts in the tears. Upon hearing this news, Graven Ash of the Disfavored and the voices of Narat of the Scarlet Chorus get into an argument about how to take over the Ascension Hall, and it's left up to you to figure out the problem. This first act of tyranny is so cool because it immediately throws you into the belly of the beast. You only have seven days of real in-game time to solve the issue, and keep in mind every time you travel on the world map, you're wasting real in-game hours, meaning things like side missions and objectives become a much harder thing to manage since failing this first act results in you failing the game entirely before you even reach the main parts of the story. I know a lot of gamers hate narrative pressures like this. Even in games where you can spend all the time you want lollygagging around regardless of if you're about to die, like say in Cyberpunk 2077. But personally, I actually really love that Tyranny presents real challenges and consequences right from the start. It's the same reason I've grown to adore games like Prey Mooncrash too. 
It gives you a sense of urgency and importance that a lot of other games really never manage to make you feel, and you can tell right from the beginning that the stakes are very high, and things only ramp up from here. Because it's at the Scarlet Chorus camp that we can travel to after declaring the edict that we see our first real sense of evil in this world. Meeting with some of the captains of the Barbarian tribe, we find that they have captured a handful of Tearsman enemies and are torturing them to get information. One of them, a young woman named Varya Kell, claims that she has information on the location of some of her previous allies in the Vendrian Guard, a group of rebels in the Tears, who she is willing to sell out as long as we let her go free. Varya has lost faith that they can overcome Kairos' rule, and has determined that she would rather serve than perish. This scene can play out in a dizzying amount of ways, including using your authority as a fate binder to set her free from her shackles, but the most sinister outcomes come from trying to extract information from her. Worried that she may give false information or lead you into a trap, you realize that you need to test her loyalty somehow, in order to make sure she is on you and the Scarlet Chorus's side. And one of the options here is to force her to slaughter the other inmates tied up next to her, giving her a small makeshift weapon that she then uses to butcher her friends and family who sat by her side during their previous bouts of torture. It's an absolutely harrowing scene, and while in this game because of its lower budget it's left to nothing but a text description, it still immaculately gets the point of cross. This is a world of pure evil, of men and women driven to the brink of their humanity in order to survive just one more day. The Tearsmen want to defend against this coming invasion, but amongst all of their ranks is still fear of failure and a dying sense of hope. After all, the rest of the continent succumbed to Kairos' rule, why would the Tears not? It makes you wonder what you would do in a situation like this. Would you kill innocent prisoners in order to secure your own freedom? What is freedom worth anyways? Maybe it would just be better to give up and join an all-powerful overlord, right? Maybe there would be less to worry about. These are the type of situations and questions that Tyranny thrives in, and it's what makes the game so special, despite all of its other faults, one of them being the inventory system, which is just bad. After this encounter, depending on what you do, you can get a new party member named Elantry, one of my favorite companions in the game, and this is where you first might have a full party of four people, which is where the inventory and game systems start to show their pitfall. Oftentimes you'll find yourself, especially during the late game, with an entire inventory full of shit you don't care about, with hard Hard to navigate menus, and a UI that's just confusing and clunky. In my playthroughs, I ignore almost everything I pick up, unless it's really good when I look at it at first glance looting, in which case I just have to sift through my entire inventory menu to find the right item I just picked up to then compare it against what my character has. New items appearing at the top helps, but it doesn't get rid of the main issue that this whole system is just a mess. And it's only further exacerbated by the fact that you have to manage each individual character's inventory too. You know, as I've been playing more and more CRPGs, I've gotten better at managing inventory systems like this, but especially for a newcomer, Tyranny's inventory is much more annoying than it is fun. Luckily though, the rest of the UI is passable, with the interfaces for things like skill selection and your quest log being nothing out of the ordinary, but nothing great either. The one thing about this system here though that is really special is a feature I love that separates Tyranny from its peers. Because in Tyranny, you're actually able to make your own spells. I mentioned earlier that the magic classes in Tyranny are much stronger than the melee ones, and this is why. Throughout the game, you come across sigils of magical power that allow you to augment your party and their abilities. Depending on your lore skill, you are able to craft stronger and stronger combinations and permutations of any spell you can think of. To create a spell, you first select a core sigil, which determines the main attribute of the spell. For example, if it will be fire, ice, or an imbuement on your weapon. The expressions then determine how this spell will act. Will it be a long-ranged missile? A massive AoE? A combination of both? Maybe a burst that travels from one enemy to the next in a non-stop onslaught. And then after all of this, you can also add accents, which will alter the spell and its effects in small ways like adding damage over time effects and more. It's a really genius system because it allows you to create fun and interesting spells like massive ice waves that travel from enemy to enemy and puts them to sleep while freezing them, but still is straightforward enough it isn't overbearing at all. Each spell combination already has a predetermined spell name and effect, so it also allows the game to be balanced around it. However, having said that, the reason lore in this game is so important is because creating these higher level spells and effects requires a very high level lore stat at the end game, which is essential for any high difficulty playthrough of this game considering spells are a must for winning any combat encounter. And it's also why the first act of this game is by far the hardest, because you have had the least 
least amount of time to level up your lore stat and find more sigils to create more powerful spells. Another interesting system I haven't mentioned too is that besides creating your own spells and leveling up your character in order to pick ones from their skill trees, you can actually unlock more spells and abilities as well by gaining more favor or fear with the companions in the factions. Instead of the usual good and evil from most RPGs, Tyranny uses this fear or favor system, which I personally enjoy as it helps you roleplay as this evil tyrant, who either gains respect or fear in order to command. But nonetheless, the best part of this system is it means the more each companion or tribe likes or hates you, the more powerful things you can unlock. For example, with one of your companions, if you gain enough favor with them, you can actually unlock an ability that's a combo between the two of you, where you both cast the same ability at the same time and knock an enemy prone and do massive damage, which especially at lower levels is a huge lifesaver in most fights. Furthermore, as you get later into the game, you start to unlock lots and lots of higher level gear, which also can be leveled up to provide individual skills and powers otherwise impossible to get. And on top of all of this too, each of the companions in game has their own ability abilities and mechanics that no other character in game can have, meaning the depth in terms of your character and party builds and compositions can actually be really cool and in depth when you take into account everything you manage all at once. It was something I wasn't expecting. So the actual systems in the game revolving around combat, in my opinion, are kind of great. The issue is that the combat itself is still just too slow, overbearing, and tedious, especially when compared to other games in the same genre. A lot of you might not know this, but I only just recently started getting into CRPGs. And besides the fact that I can't believe how much I was missing out on, CRPGs are known for some very, very in-depth combat systems. Usually these systems are split between real-time, like tyranny and turn-based, which I vastly prefer, especially since the first game that got me into this genre was actually Wasteland 3. In Wasteland 3 and other turn-based CRPGs like Baldur's Gate 3, combat takes place in a turn-based system, where each of your characters gets one action or a handful of them based on action points per turn, and once you are done with your character, you end your turn and move on to the next, with your enemy either going after you or in between each of your characters based on the game. The reason I like this system so much more than the traditional real time ones is that it allows you to have a more tactical sense of the battlefield and really think through each of your decisions in combat. It makes you feel like every move you make has a huge impact on the battlefield. I can't tell you how many times in Tyranny's real time system I had to pause and try to move my guy in different directions only for the pathing to mess up and then I lose my ability to use a skill in the 5 second interval while all the animations bug out. It's a system that can be much better too though, as Obsidian's follow-up game Pillars of Eternity 2 showed us. But in Tyranny specifically, all of the intricate and cool systems of spell crafting and party composition make no difference when the combat itself is such a tedious endeavor to get through, until the very final hours of the game when your spells are so powerful that you can just blow up everything on screen, and it becomes fun because of all of the chaos and bright shining lights. The real importance of this game doesn't come from the combat or spell systems or party dynamics though. These are all things that usually aren't good in older games. The real reason everyone needs to know about this game is because of the story it tells and the questions it asks. After that potentially horrific scene at the Scarlet Chorus camp watching a prisoner kill her peers, you set out on an adventure to fulfill Kairos' edict, meaning eventually you will have to either side with the disfavored, Scarlet Chorus, or even the Rebel Tearsmen. On my first playthrough, I actually did ally myself with the Rebels and betrayed my alliance with both Graven Ash and the Voices of Narat. In most games, this would have meant I would now have to fight against Kairos and the game was over. But in Tyranny, the philosophy of evil is a lot more cunning and conniving than it is black and white. You see, by aligning myself with the rebels, you devise a plan in which you are able to still fulfill Kairos' edict. The edict simply stated that the ancient spire must be conquered in the name of Kairos. But not by who? So you can fight your way past the armies of the Disfavored and the Scarlet Chorus attacking the Rebel Stronghold in order to make it to the Halls and claim them with the Rebels by your side. Instead of having to do exactly as Cairo said, rather, you can simply fulfill the demands within the stipulations you have, and it makes you begin to wonder. What are Kairos' real goals here in the Tears? Because Kairos isn't your run-of-the-mill villain. Instead, they are a very intelligent and motivated leader, whose true goals and intentions are never truly known. In the game, we never even get full confirmation on who or what Kairos is, with some calling him a man, others her a girl, and even a select few a mythical beast or god. And while we did hear in one developer interview pre-release that Kairos is in fact a girl, there are so many elements to her character that we still yet aren't aware of. 
For example, why is Kairos okay with you allying yourself with the rebels and the tears? Wouldn't that be disadvantageous to her goals of taking over the region? You cause Kairos' greatest armies, that being the Disfavored and the Scarlet Chorus, to plunge into all-out war. How could this all-powerful leader be happy about that? Well, the reason is because Tyranny shows us what real evil is like, not the cartoonishly maniacal versions we often see in games and movies. It's reasonable to think that with the Tears being the final frontier that Kairos has yet to conquer, that after the invasion has finished, her two great armies would have nothing to do. And when great armies have nothing to do, as we have seen often in history, they rebel. So could it be that Kairos is thinking ahead? Maybe she's worried about the stability of Tyratus post taking over the tears, and by secretly forging a civil war of sorts between her great armies, she could not only take over the tears, but massively weaken their forces all in one fell swoop. That way, when the entirety of Tyratus was hers, she would no longer have to deal with potentially her biggest threat. This would mean that Kairos has purposely orchestrated a conflict between the two great leaders, and the reason she sent you specifically to declare the edict is she knew you could cause an even greater division based on your past in the conquest mode. Kairos is willing to sacrifice her greatest warriors and people through means of deception in order to achieve her endgame. This is what real evil looks like. Powerful and charismatic leaders who see themselves as doing heinous acts for the greater good. Kairos is always one step ahead. But things are only about to get a lot more interesting, because after taking over the ascension halls by whatever means necessary, you are teleported to the top of the spire, which reaches for miles into the sky, well above the clouds. And it's here you find a strange and massive contraption ancient in nature. The hum of its resonance and the vibration of its call soothes your soul, and it gives you flashbacks to what is apparently a civilization from thousands of years ago, the original builders of these spires, beings of great power and importance. Not only are you now potentially the only person who has ever ended an edict and lived to tell the story, but you are also seeing things and hearing voices all while being teleported to the top of an ancient structure made by a hyper-advanced lost civilization that lived thousands of years ago. And this is where Act 2 and the main game begin. The rest of Tyranny is about us discovering more and more of these spires and uncovering their secrets, all while helping or hurting tons of different factions across the tiers in a goal to either ultimately help or betray Kairos. Talking about each and every one of these encounters would take hours, so instead I just want to touch on the moments that for me define why this game is so great, and why for me at least, it makes me think a lot about philosophy and our own real world. The first comes from a place we travel to called the Vendrian Well, where a faction known as the Bronze Brotherhood, a legion of fighters dressed in bronze, are in an argument with the inhabitants of the well, including a faction of great weapon and armor smiths called the Forgebound. We are instructed to try and gain the loyalty of one or both of these factions in order to help our cause against Kairos, and it's our job to figure out how to fix these issues between the two factions in whatever way we see fit. The Bronze Legion is led by fearsome warriors who would help us in battle, but the Forgebound are able to craft iron weapons, which are extremely significant because they are much easier to make than bronze, which requires multiple raw materials to make and is less dependable. In Tyranny, the world is still stuck in the Bronze Age, but with recent discoveries of iron, technology and warfare is starting to quickly advance. And it's because of this that the Disfavored and the Scarlet Chorus are also involved, trying to gain control over this very important iron forging resource. And this means that through this first section of quests, you must decide who to help, what to do, all in a world filled with choice and consequence. And every single part of the game is structured like this. You come into a new zone on the map looking for allies, and discover multiple varied factions and leaders all with their own goals of what they want. And in order to gain alliance with anyone, you must first forego the favor of others. Meaning in each and every mission, you are often making choices that will drastically affect who will help you and who will hate you going forward. And remember, each decision you make also affects the skills and abilities you will get in combat based on your favor and fear with each faction, which is something I absolutely love when games do, where narrative and gameplay intertwine so elegantly. It's one of the strongest points in the entire narrative of the game, and means that throughout the entire runtime, things remain interesting because your entire success in taking over the tiers relies on you choosing your allies wisely, whether that be multiple different factions in the tiers or the disfavored and scarlet chorus alike. Another great example of this is at one point you meet a group of magic users in the Stone Sea, which is a zone overtaken by a great edict from Kairos called the Edict of Stone, which caused massive devastation for the whole landscape with constant earthquakes and tectonic shifts, choking rivers and collapsing roads alike. In this region are the Magical Earthshakers, a small arm of the Disfavored Legion who pray to their Archon leader, Karen. 
the Archon of Stone, as well as the Stone Stalkers, which is a massive tribe of beastmen who are hellbent on trying to keep control of the lands which they see rightfully as theirs. In my first playthrough, I aligned myself with the Beastmen tribe and convinced them to allow the Earthshakers to leave peacefully with their possessions, all with the help of one of my companions who was a beast woman who convinced the beast tribes I was a good person. The tribes of the Stone Stalkers have been tortured and neglected for years, and we can even find multiple scenes of horror and violence, like at one point when we can walk into a town that's on the verge of stoning one of these monsters to death in the town square who is innocent of any wrongdoing. But we can also hear stories from the locals in town about beasts who are violent and kill recklessly, which we can see for ourselves if we talk to enough of them and become more integrated into the beast tribe's culture of violence and superiority. There is a side to both stories in this tale, and it makes your decision on who to help and what to do all that more difficult. It's moments like this that make tyranny so great, the companions you bring with you, the choices you make that all affect the outcome of each part of the world. And it was because of my actions here that I was able to eventually end the edict in the lands, meaning I no longer had to suffer all the debuffs while in combat when I was traveling through this region. There's also a deep sense of lore and world building everywhere you go that also integrates fantastically into the systems of combat and game, and it makes each area you go to interesting in its own right. It feels like each zone is a place that's been lived in for hundreds of years, and you are now only stumbling upon it and learning about it. And maybe the best example of this in the entire game is the spires. As mentioned before, in each of these areas you go to are massive and great spires, which you can capture to gain not only teleportation points, but also more information about what they even are. These spires are built into what are called the Old Walls, which are massive and impressive structures built all across the tiers and left behind from that same ancient civilization that built the spires, and in each of these old walls, you traverse through them in order to find an entrance or secrets to unlocking the puzzles to each spire. The old walls are filled with an enemy called the Bane, which based on some rare text we can find in game, might just be the remnants of the long lost civilization which created the magics we see in the world today on our playthrough. The awesome thing about the spires though is that after unlocking each of them, you get more and more things revealed to you, until you eventually reach the big twist of the game. The spires themselves are some sort of magical system conduits of great power that channel immense and unknown magics that can form into what we know as edicts. That means that Kairos' power isn't some sort of divine will, as many of the people across Teratus have come to assume, but rather a harnessing of the ancient magics of a long-lost hyper-intelligent civilization that we now only see echoes of in the banes of the Old Walls. With this realization too towards the end of the game, we get our very own ability to cast edicts ourselves, meaning we can quite literally change the entire landscape of the regions we've been going around, forcing enemies and allies alike into great perils. The most interesting part about this entire sequence though isn't the fact that we start to get the powers of a god, but rather, tyranny's commentary on what it even means to be a god. You see, by gaining the power to cast edicts ourselves, we have in the eyes of many people around us become a god of sorts, like Kairos, and in those moments we can see many characters struggle with their beliefs. Before they saw Kairos as an all-powerful being, but now that you have acquired the same power, their belief has been shaken, and with that loss of belief comes a great loss of power. After all, if the citizens of the Tears believe Kairos can be stopped, then he can. Many times in our real lives, power comes not from feats of raw strength or intellect, but rather from others' view of both. What I mean by that is that the true source of power, the energy which fuels conquerors and gods alike, is belief. The moment that the citizens of the Tears stopped believing in the will of Kairos is the moment that his will ceased to exist. It's an interesting realization, and a really fascinating way to look at evil and power, as something that can only exist when you believe in it. So by becoming a beacon of hope from which others can be inspired through you, the true power you gain at the end of tyranny isn't the ability to cast edicts, but rather the ability to inspire others to fight back. And so in the final moments of the game, you hear word that the full armadas of Kairos and her remaining armies are on their way to the tears, and that you will have to face the threat head on. But this time with the belief of thousands backing you, the complete opposite to the start of the game where many tearsmen are giving up and surrendering because of a belief that they can't win. It's the philosophical thoughts like this that tyranny tackles that make it such an interesting game. Is it just to kill a so-called beast because they are different from you in order to protect the people you love? Is it right to slaughter your fellow captives in order to save yourself and your future? And most importantly, is Kairos even evil? In the game, we know that Kairos has killed thousands in the name of power, 
and has casted countless edicts which have wrought havoc on the world and its peoples. But Kairos isn't killing just to kill. She's killing because she wants to take over all of Teratis for a very specific reason. In some letters and ancient scripts we can find in game, we learn that Kairos' main goal seems to be uniting Teratis under one banner, such that the society in this rugged and tough world can thrive and live in peace. It's a foolish thought many dictators think is achievable, but that doesn't mean that their heart isn't in the right place. While the game focuses on many of the bad things Kairos has done, there are subtle hints on all the good she's done as well. We see cities that have given themselves to Kairos be treated with respect, rule, and order, with lower amounts of crime and murder than anywhere else in the entire continent. We see women in the armies of Kairos being given great positions of power and equality, whereas before across all Teratis, men ruled over women with an iron fist. And while Kairos' rules and judgments are strict and cruel, they are very, very fair. That's why even when we commit acts that you would think would have gotten us killed in the early game, we still get the chance to make our case in front of the Archon Tunon, who is Kairos' Archon of Justice. However cruel Kairos can be, they're still a person of great purpose and conviction. Someone who truly believes that they are forging a better world, and must accept great loss in order to get there. This is what evil looks like in the real world. Evil isn't just some magical being that simply wants everyone to die. Evil, good, gods, the divine, is all a look to a greater sense of being within all of us. A sense that we can make the world a greater place. Maybe Kairos' only fault is that they set out to do it in the wrong way. And as to how they even got the power in the first place shows just how important belief is. I mentioned how at the start of the game you declare Kairos' edict and have 7 days to resolve it or die in Act 1. But what I didn't mention is that you can actually simply delay even reading the edict out loud, and this gives you the time to do whatever you want and level up before easily tackling the challenges ahead. It was only by actually reading the edict out loud and putting belief into words that its evil came true. Maybe the edicts from Kairos find their true power in nothing more than that. After all, even the mere idea that all will die leads the disfavored and scarlet chorus into an all-out civil war. There's a quote from a missive in game from another one of your Fatebinder friends named Meothis, where he says it best, Kairos's most powerful weapon is not the edict. It's her ability to hand us rope that we willingly use to hang ourselves. Never forget this. Remember, Something only has power if you allow it to, if you feed into it. Evil can only survive in a world that lets it, in a world that believes in evil. And through all of the actions you take in game, being the twisted torturer or the righteous savior alike, it's only because of others' belief in you and your authority under Kairos that you have the right, the power, to take action. That's what makes Tyranny such an exciting game. This deep look into evil, humanity, and what it really means to be a god, to have power all in a package that most gamers won't even ever play, in a genre that's usually reserved for a very niche audience. And there's one last story in this game I need to touch on, the most powerful moment in the entire journey. You see, at one point you travel to a location called the Blade Grave, which is currently under the onslaught of the Edict of Storms, which ravages the lands with non-stop winds, lightning, and rain. The Edict was placed in the Blade Grave, part of the Stalwart Zone, due to a man named Stratus Herodon, regent to the lands, who during a battle abandoned in his post and hid behind the castle walls, and for his cowardice, Kairos demanded all of the regent's bloodline be killed or the lands would suffer forever. The regent had a strong band of followers though, who all protect him and his castle from any potential invader. And so as the man or woman who must end edicts, it's your job to go to Stratus and solve the situation. This takes you on a long journey talking to different factions and eventually fighting your way to the throne room where Stratus sits. You can try to convince the man to off himself, to save that one bit of honor he has left inside of him in order to stop the pain of so many others in the blade grave. But your words do not get through to him. Out of his own hubris, Stratus refuses to believe anyone can lead his peoples as well as him. And you also pick up on a sense of hopelessness and him being afraid of something. Stratus is afraid to die, to give up on himself and sacrifice for the greater good, just as he was afraid to do before. But even in those last moments, you begin to feel sorry for Stratus. But it must be done, and you slaughter him before his very own people. Strangely though, in that moment, the edict does not stop and instead the storm ravages on. Confused, you look between yourself and your party as to what has happened, and that's when the big twist comes. Graven Ash's daughter shows herself to you and proclaims her loyalty to Stratus and his people, and reveals to you the horrifying truth of what you missed. She had a baby with Stratus, a baby that carries the bloodline of this pitiful region, 
and by the own proclamations of the Edict of Storms, it may only end when this region's bloodline is finished. And so it's at this moment that you realize Stratus was protecting not only himself, but the life of an innocent child. So as you walk over to the baby's crib, you are met with one of the most appalling choices in a game. Do you slaughter this innocent baby as it lies wrapped in its blanket whining, in order to stop the spell that ravages the lands and thrusts thousands into pain and turmoil? Or do you let one life live at the expense of an entire region of this great world? This baby has done no wrong. It has killed no one and done no evil, and it just lost its father. And yet, because of the evil actions of one man who simply didn't know how to handle the situations he was in, this baby must now suffer the ultimate punishment by proxy. It's a perfect example of the twisted nature of evil. By killing this baby, we become a monster, someone that other characters who we've grown to love can barely look at. But it can also be argued that this is the right choice, because if you do kill the baby, then the storm will end and an entire generation of thousands of innocent people can thrive. Sometimes evil occurs because we have no choice, whether it be for survival or what we see as the greater good. The exact same situation you could argue Kairos is in, and another moment in this game that shows just how deep its themes and story go. There's actually another choice as well in this moment, where if you have a high enough lore stat, you can remind everyone and the mother that they can simply pronounce the baby as abdicating the throne, and thus the edict will end. But this choice somewhat takes away from the power of the moment. And while I personally love when games give you decisions like this, where your character build can massively help you in certain situations, I can also see how this would ruin an otherwise fantastic moment of storytelling. What it doesn't ruin, however, is the ideas that this game puts into your head, about what it means to even be a god of the people, about ancient civilizations and lost technology, and whether we should be messing around with such great power, about the nature of true evil and why some people commit acts others could never imagine, about the humanity of simply trying to survive in a world so wrought with chaos about playing as the bad guy and choosing to plunge deeper into madness in order to achieve a greater goal, or instead foregoing your power in order to do what you see as right. Tyranny makes us ask some of the most fundamental questions in life, all wrapped into an awesome story with so much choice and consequence that multiple playthroughs are essentially a must to get the most out of the game. And while the game also falters on so many fronts, like combat and user experience in the menus and inventory, there are so many cool ideas from this game that deserve more love and recognition. And more than anything else I've played from Obsidian Entertainment, this game specifically showed me just how versatile this studio can really be. I hope one day Tyranny can get the big budget sequel it deserves, where we can finally meet Kairos on the battlefield of gods and learn more about the ancient secrets and philosophies of one of the greatest RPGs of all time that almost no one knows about. You know, I only recently started getting into CRPGs, before I only really played big games like Dragon Age, Mass Effect, Skyrim, and The Witcher. But sometimes, the greatest stories that really make you think are in the places you'd least expect. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching and supporting what I do. If you want to support the channel even more, make sure to check out the channel membership link down below and my GOG affiliate links if you want to buy some games and support me there. And also, make sure to check out all my other social media channels if you want to hear my thoughts on everything happening in gaming on a daily basis, since I know you guys usually have to wait quite a bit in between each of these videos. But I hope you all have a great day, and until next time.